thank you all for coming. I do appreciate it. Um, like I said, my name is Russ. I am evangelist for Zen Project, which means I have a very big mouth. I know what an airport is. I know how to use it. Um, so I go dancing around talking to people about things that have to do uh, with Zen and or virtualization and or clouds. Uh, here's my background. I'm not going to bother reading you the slide. I think you can figure it out on your own. Uh, the bottom line is, you know, this is my 20th year dealing with Linux. And that entire time has been really just promoting open source. I love open source. I love what it does for people. And I love when people get involved. So I'm just glad that you're all here, uh, regardless of what your background is. Um, this should be a really great event, so I'm just thankful that you're all here. OK. I'm evangelist for Zen Project. I'm not an actual Unikernel implementer, although I do hang out with them quite a bit. Um, Zen Project, as we'll find out in the next few minutes, uh, does have a lot to do with Unikernels. And uh, you know, we'll talk about the ecosystem and so forth. One of the things I found was that there are Unikernel developers out there, and they've talked about what they've done. But to a very large extent, they're being ignored because there is a forest and trees issue. Uh, when you talk about individual trees, then it's a question of how interested are you in that particular tree. Uh, one of the things that I'm able to do is step back and say, wait a second, there's a forest growing here. Forests are a lot harder to ignore uh, because they have impact. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the forest a bit. That is all, all this that's coming in unikernels and the trees, what's out there right now. And uh, we'll see a little bit about the value and the impact that this is going to have. And I believe that in the next few years, what's coming out of the unikernel world is going to remake what we think of when we say cloud, quite honestly. So let's just talk a little bit about that. What's the, the importance of unikernels? And probably the best place to start is with the cloud. Now, if you've dealt with cloud-type software at all, uh, you know that most efforts really have to do with orchestration right now. Uh, I used to work for a company, a startup company that failed, like many, uh, that was actually doing cloud infrastructure, what, what you might call infrastructure as a service support, well before the word cloud was actually in the vernacular. Uh, at the time that we started, we called it agile infrastructure. We didn't know what else to call it. But ever since the birth of what we call cloud these days, it's always been focused on trying to get the orchestration together, how to get things to move around in a cloud-like manner. We have in the cloud application stacks that look pretty much like they've always looked. Full operating systems, utilities, and software built on top. We took what we were running in the normal data center, we moved it into the cloud, and that was pretty much it. Um, so things tend to be pretty beefy. You know, I mean, even if you're running a virtual machine image, it still has all the weight as if it was sitting on a piece of hardware. Um, so it works, but it's not really that efficient. And uh, you know, if you've been around virtualization for a while, you know that if you manage to get tens of VMs on a single host up until a couple of years ago, you were doing really well. That was a lot of VMs to have on one physical machine. Now, what was the next generation of cloud? What's it going to look like? Well, it's time to really start looking at workloads, those things that we put into the cloud, the things that we haven't changed. They should be easier to deploy and manage. They should have a smaller footprint, right? We don't need all that stuff there. We don't need unnecessary duplication. Let's get rid of that. Should have really fast startup times. I mean, why are we waiting several minutes for individual VMs to start, to start doing something useful? I mean, uh, there's really no need for that. You know, how about the issue of transient microservices? If, you, if you've been talking, talked with anyone in the architecture community about microservices and all this sort of stuff, little things that just do the job, well, why do they have to stick around when they're not being used? Why don't they come and go? We'll talk about that in a little bit. We want higher levels of security. I mean, if you've dealt with cloud security at all, you probably have the scorch marks on your back to prove it. 
It's one of those things that's the eternal bugaboo in the cloud. And we'd love to get up to thousands of VMs per host. That would be really, really cool if we get lots and lots of these small, useful VMs working. By the way, these slides are all up on zenproject.org, so if you, if you like scurrying to take pictures or record URLs or whatever, don't need to, just go to zenproject.org in the presentation section. You can download and look at anything you want. Now, there's been stuff that's been done already in this area, which is really kind of cool. How many people have heard of Dockers? Docker and containers, yeah. Now, Docker does some interesting things. It makes for easier deployment. It's got a smaller footprint. It's sort of reusing the host kernel, so it doesn't need all that extra stuff all over again, which is really cool. As a result, it takes less memory, less disk space. These are all very good things. It's smaller. It's faster. It includes a lot faster startup times. That's also terrific. And it allows you to have those higher number of VMs per host. That's a pretty good start right there. But there are downsides to trying to use containers for everything. Uh, and, you know, we have to be aware of them and we have to use it wisely. Uh, obviously, you can't use any payload because it's container technology. It shares the kernel. Anything that uses a different kernel, you're not going to be able to stuff in a container. In other words, you're not going to have a Windows VM, God forbid, inside a, uh, a Linux, uh, Linux container. Can't, can't do that. It has some limits to scalability, potentially. I mean, you think about Linux, you can run thousands of processes on a single machine. Is that optimal? Well, maybe, maybe not. Security, once again, is a huge issue. And it's a huge issue inside the Docker land, too, because there's still people working on security, they say someday. I was at LinuxCon North America last year. The Docker CEO gave his five big goals for the next year. Security wasn't one of them. It's like, OK. So he's looking at other things. And even, you know, people talk about Google uses container technology and so forth, and that's cool. But even they, inside their talks at the same conference, said, well, you know, when we need it secure, we throw them in a VM. So clearly, the container, uh, container technology is good, but not for every use case. Now let's take a look at the unikernel. The unikernel concept is also very small, very efficient. It's very quick to boot, and we'll look at some of the data about this. This is actually really, really cool. And probably the biggest difference, it's very, very secure. Instead of taking security and making it looser, it makes it much tighter than it did, than it did before. It's actual green technology, as in energy saving, which can actually save green cash out of the box. That's really, really important if you're working inside you know, commercial space and you want adoption. Um, some years ago, probably about 10 years ago now, I was working with a data center in southern Virginia. I was talking with the fellow who designed this data center. It was massive. And he said, you know, this data center is full. I said, what do you mean it's full? You don't even have the lights on in half the, half the thing. You don't have the racks up. What do you mean it's full? He said, no, no, no. I know where every single machine is going to go in this, in this entire data center. And when I get every machine in, it will be full. I will not be able to put one more server in this place. And I said, well, why would you design a data center that day one lights on is full? He said, because I went to the power company, and I said, how much power can you give me? And they said, this much, no more. So I built it to that power footprint. I'm maxed out. If I want more, I have to go somewhere else and build another data center with an entirely different power line because they can't give me any more. So sometimes, you know, if we're thinking about we're working in our individual labs or whatnot, we think that power is endless. And if we need more machines, well, we just add more machines, get a little bit more power. But power is not endless. So things that can bring down our power footprint, that can reduce the number of servers, and the amount of uh, air conditioning and whatnot 
cooling to, to service them. If we can reduce that footprint, we're really not only doing good for the environment, but we're doing good for ourselves. Because as data centers get larger and larger, and believe me, after being in this industry for 30 years, they're getting larger and larger. We need something that's going to be smaller and smaller. We need to be able to conserve. And that's where the unikernel concept, I think, really comes in. Now, there are many unikernels that exist. We'll talk about a few of them today. And, uh, and so, you know, we'll start with what's the definition? What's a unikernel? How many people, you, you have an idea of what a unikernel is? Show of hands. OK, we're starting to get out. That's pretty cool. Now, Mirage OS, which is in the Zen Project Incubator, it's uh, sort of our unikernel project, one of them, uses this definition, so I borrowed it from them. It says, unikernels are specialized virtual machine images compiled from the modular stack of application code, system libraries, and configuration. You may say, well, that sounds like any application stack. Well, this is an entire application stack, including operation, uh, operating system stuff, in a single image not a multi-level uh, layered image like we normally do in a VM. One image. So what's this look like? Here's some development slides. We'll start with the process of developing the software. Well, we have Mirage has its own compiler. It compiles, you know, this part of the stack, the configuration files, application binary, and language runtime. And it results in a unikernel output, which is then put on top of Unix and or Linux-like operating system as part of the development process. That looks fairly routine. But then the next stage, you want to go into testing. The compiler does something a little different. It actually takes not only the configuration, application, binary, and language runtime, but it adds in the kernel threads, user processes, file system, network stack into one image. And all of that sits on top of Unix and or Linux-like operating system during the testing phase. What about deployment? It changes yet again. We take this entire stack, we compile it into a unikernel, which sits on top of the hypervisor, which sits on top of the metal, period. What do you see on the right side, or what's missing? There is no operating system present. It's not needed. The unikernel has what it needs from the hypervisor layer. Now, for people who don't know the Zen architecture, Zen is a bare metal or type 1 hypervisor. That is, it sits directly on the metal. It isn't like some other ones that use a host operating system that rely on that operating system to do certain things. Zen works directly on metal. So this slice here where it talks about Zen and the hardware is paper thin in terms of footprint. So you have a very thin layer. You have the unikernel stack sitting on top of it. The net result is something that's very tight, very small, and very fast. So here are the unikernel concepts. You want just enough to get the job done. That's it. You don't need multiple users in most things. Say you're running a web server. Why do you care about a full multi-user operating system. No, you just want the packet to come in, to be serviced, and a response sent out. That's it. So you don't need all that overhead. You don't need a full general purpose operating system. You know, why do you need grep on a, on a web server? Or why would you need awk on a database? You don't. So it's not there. So there's no need for utilities. And you don't even need a full set of operating system functions. You only need whatever functions are required to get that particular job done, period. That's it. Minimalism. So it's lean and mean. It's very minimal, minimal waste, very small in size. Anyone work in embedded space at all? couple of people. This may look familiar. It's sort of embedded theory now in a data center. So debugging in the embedded world, you're kind of, you have to build into your stack whatever you need for whatever live debugging you're doing. Same here in the unikernel world. 
Otherwise, you may have to reproduce system failures outside of the live system. And frankly, in a lot of production systems, people get a little bit wonky about you debugging things in the middle of the production system anyway. So chances are you're doing a lot of this stuff under development as it is, but now your developed environment will look a little different than your live environment, because that live environment's got to be tight and small. And that's kind of the trade-off for getting these ultralight images into place. What do these results really look like? When I say small, what's small? Well, here's some examples from the Mirage people. They have a fully functional DNS server at 449K. Now, those of us who have a little gray hair in the temples may have to turn to some of the younger folks in the audience and explain what a kilobyte is. Because we're used to talking about gigabytes, and we're used to talking about terabytes and petabytes. Kilobytes was a word that was really, really common back when the IBM PC was new. Because they were small. They had small footprints. That's what we're talking about here. A compiled DNS server at less than half a meg. A web server, 674 kilobytes. An open flow learning switch, not even 400 kilobytes. From the Ling people, they can get boot time to, to their base level of operation in less than 100 milliseconds. How's that for a quick startup time? The Erlang on Zen.org website, you can click on it and say, how much memory are you using right now? Because they're eating their own dog food. When I put the slide together, I clicked on it, it said it was using 8.7 megabytes of memory to actually run. Here's another one, Click OS. Anyone aware of Click as a you know, network functional device? We'll talk about that a little bit too. They actually have produced network devices as unikernels that can go in excess of 5 million packets per second. Not too shabby for something really tiny. They tend to run in about 6 megabytes of memory with a 30 millisecond boot time. Small, fast, impressive. Let's talk about security a little bit. How many people have dealt with certification of software? When you're talking about mission critical systems like fly-by-wire, anyone dealt with that? Okay, yes, I can tell because you normally, if you do, you probably have a large thing of Excedrin that you carry around with you at all times. It is a painful process. If you want to know more about it, if you go to the zenproject.org site and go to presentations, we actually have a really nice video that was done from our developer summit last year. Uh, where someone talked about software certification and all of the incredible amount of pain that goes into these mission critical systems. It is massively expensive. It is massively time consuming. And one of the things that they pointed out in that session is absolutely unthinkable to do it on like a full Linux stack. You can't do it because it would cost millions and millions of dollars and so many years to get it done. It's just not reasonable. That's why certification of systems is generally done on embedded because it's small and you can actually work through. The other piece of that tends to be type safe programming, you know, Haskell and OCaml and some of these kind of more esoteric uh, languages that you can actually go through and do a full certification because they are type safe. You don't have to worry about the hanging pointer somewhere that something got missed. It's just not possible. So I mean, that sort of thing happens, but those possibilities exist in the unikernel world. We'll talk about that in just a second. Also, when you actually compile a unikernel, like I said, it only takes those functions that it needs inside the end result. So the image footprints are unique to that compiled image. You can't rely on SSH being there or any other function being there. You can't break out and go get down to the bash uh, the bash script or anything else that you can manipulate. You have what you have. It's a lump of memory. That's it. So it's a very hard egg to crack. So the intruders can't rely on what they know. They have to be very, very smart. And you don't have, if you do break it, you don't have any utilities to exploit. So not only you have to be 
smart enough to break, but then you have to be smart enough to do something with a broken lump of memory that has no utility value to it. So that's a real nice security story. So let's talk about the trees. That was the forest view. Let's talk about the tree view. Here's a few of the ones that are out there right now, and we'll talk about these for the next couple of minutes. One is Mirage OS, which is part of the Zen Project Incubator. There's HalVM from Galois, Ling from the Erlang on Zen people, ClickOS from NEC Europe. OSV, how many people have heard of OSV? Anyone? OK. OSV is a really interesting thing. They do things a little differently from Cloudius systems. Uh, when we talk about them, they've got some really interesting things. Rump Run from the Rump Kernel people, which comes out of the BSD camp. Really neat things going on there, and I'll, I'll really spend some time on that. This is just the beginning, folks. These are just a few of the trees. So let's take a look at a few of them. Mirage, like I said, in the incubator. Language support is OCaml. How many OCaml programmers? About what I figured. <laughs> a little esoteric, but it runs. The hypervisor that it sits on, Zen. It's not exactly new. Version 2 was released last year. It's useful for, for general purpose devices. And what's more, you can take a Mirage image right now and throw it onto Amazon EC2. By the way, for people who aren't aware, Amazon is one of the largest Zen instances in the world. It's Zen-based. So you can just pop one of those unit controls right out there and have it run. How does that work? Is that an AMI? Is that an AMI? How does that work? Uh, you, actually, you're better off talking to one of the Mirage people to find out exactly what they're doing with it. But, uh, Excuse me. I know that does work. I haven't been there. I haven't tried it. I'm sorry. There's a lot of these ones, unfortunately, that I haven't had a chance to play with. HalVM, Galois, language support, Haskell. How many Haskell programmers? Oh, great. Two more than the OCaml programmers. We're getting popular now. Now you kind of see why it's possible to sort of start ignoring. If you talk about the trees alone, you can ignore these things. It's like, ah. Who knows about OCaml? I don't care about Haskell. Just hang with me a couple of minutes. Once again, built on top of Zen Project, and there's a reason for that. We'll talk about that later. Uh, it was originally to used for them just to prototype some operating system components. They wanted a way to test. But now they are actually creating network devices using, using HalVM. And there's their URL, like I said, for the latecomers. These slides are out on zenproject.org, so you don't need to be busy scurrying down URLs. You can just grab the deck and do whatever you want with them. Ling, that came out of the Erlang on Zen people. No surprise, language support is Erlang. How many Erlang programmers? As many as OCaml programmers. OK, there we go. Uh, also built on Zen, they have this interesting use case They've got several interesting use cases, but one of them is this thing called the Zero Footprint Cloud. Let's take a look at that for a second. A uh, couple things. Right now, if you, if you went to their website, they have a little button in the upper right-hand corner, which I won't attempt to do live because I've done enough talks in my life to never, never trust the Wi-Fi at any conference. <laughs> so if you do, you'll end up looking, seeing a screen that looks similar to this. And they'll show you exactly how much memory is being used and what resources are being used to run their website, which is built on Ling. When I did this one, as you can see, the memory usage is 12.7 megabytes, which is kind of interesting. And it shows you the details because they're geeks. They like to show you details. But then if you go into their Zerg demo, Zerg being their uh, this zero footprint cloud, you end up with, you click on a button and you get this response. It says 300 seconds is how long it takes to launch a Linux instance on EC2. 50 seconds, that's the amount of time it takes to power on and get to the lock screen on your Android phone. Four tenths of a second ago, we received your request. By the time you read this, the job has been issued, the response has been given, and it's gone. So by the time you actually get this, the process which responded to it is entirely gone. The VM is gone. It came and went like that, a fraction of a second. So they say, what about a zero footprint cloud? Let's take a look at the, you know, the standard Christmas scenario. You know, fries or somebody's going to 
going to offer you the 400 inch flat panel screen for 99 bucks on December 15th. So on December 14th, 11.59, everyone's sitting there like this at home, waiting to push the button because they want to get one of those suckers. Now, at 11.59 on the 14th, how many VMs do you need to handle traffic? Zero. Because there's nothing going on yet. The firestorm's going to hit in a second. At the time of the firestorm, say you got 50,000 requests, you're going to need, you know, 50,000 VMs, you know, out there inside some way, shape, or form, rattling away. Once everything is done, how many VMs will be left? Zero. Because unlike a standard machine, which we think of, you know, we're still thinking of in terms of old metal, when you start up metal, metal stays up until you push the button. Well, why? Why are VMs being treated like machines? Why don't they come and go according to need? Well, one of the reasons why they don't come and go according to need is because if it takes five minutes to start one, that's not fast enough. But if it can actually be started inside milliseconds, such that when the request comes down to the pipe, the VM gets started to respond to it, it does the logic response and then kills itself. Well, that's interesting. Because then you don't need massive amounts of machines humming at all times to handle a load that isn't there yet. You just need to make sure that you can handle things appropriately as they come down the pipe. Now, when it comes to network traffic, the Click OS people are really on top of this. They're from NEC Europe, not exactly a backyard operation. Language support, C, C++, and Python. How many people are interested in those languages? Ooh, we're getting a little into different space here, are we not? Hypervisor support, once again, Zen. They have ver version 0 0.2 released last year. Network function virtualization, as we said. This is a thing from their website where they talk about you can't see the uh, stress here, but down the bottom, virtual machines that are six megabytes in size boot in about 30 milliseconds and add a delay of about 45 microseconds. If you're not doing Wall Street trading, most applications can take a 45 microsecond delay. <laughs> right? So, I mean, this is not too bad. Here's a graph from their website showing throughput. And here we see in excess of 5 million packets per second going through their various devices. I mean, and we see that there's a whole bunch of devices here. If you take a look at the, the slide when I'm done, uh, or if you download it or whatever, you see anything from IP router to firewalls, load balancers. They're doing all of these sort of edge network devices which are common in every data center and they're doing small and fast. Now OSV I said is a little bit different. They're playing around with a slightly modified unikernel concept but it's still fine. Interesting stuff that they're doing. Language support C, C++, Java, Python, JavaScript, Node.js, Ruby. How many people are interested in those languages? You know if your hand isn't up you're probably not a programmer you know. <laughs> I mean, they're going at all out. Now, they have an even wider hypervisor support, not only Zen, but KVM, VMware. Uh, I know they were trying to get Hyper-V working. Um, in the unikernel world, they're kind of fat because they changed the concept just slightly. Most follow the Mirage model, which you know, takes everything and compiles it down to one single image. The OSV model sort of is a two-piece image kind of takes the, the Java concept. So you have the Java environment, which is your nest, and you pop your jar file or whatever it is that you want to play with on top. Your, that's your egg, and boom, that's it. So it takes up more memory, generally in the, uh, from what I've heard from the OSV people, you're talking about megabytes, not kilobytes. And it may get up to a few hundred megabytes, depending on how beefy it is. 
But frankly, if you have stuff that's sitting in a jar file, chances are you can pop it on top of OSB, OSB and be running today. That's it. Just pop it and go. It's, function, it's uh, once again, the network virtualization function uh, optimized. Um, it's a really good story. I don't know whether Don Marty, is Don Marty speaking here, anyone? Notice that? I'll have to give him hell if he's not. Uh, but here's some stuff from the OSV website. And they talk about using Java applications, the C and C++, and their horizontal scaling. Um, you know, they talk about using it for NoSQL as well. Interesting thing. Now, rump run. This is where things get even more, even more interesting. This is the implementation of a rump kernel. And how many people know what a rump kernel is? Okay. A little bit more than OCaml programmers. Rump run is meant to be a universal base for most unikernel appropriate workloads currently existing in real world POSIX applications. How many people are largely using POSIX based applications for those people who know what POSIX is? A lot of what goes in our data center fits this definition right here. That's the sweet spot that the rump kernels are going for. And we'll talk about that in detail in just a second. It has the potential of opening the door to a huge number of unikernel based applications. Absolutely monstrous possibilities when it comes to uh, adoption. Now before we talk about that, let's talk a little bit about unikernel ecosystem. Because if this really is a forest and not just a few trees, there should be an ecosystem, right? I mean, anytime you have a real living forest, there are things that go around the forest to help the forest to grow. It's not just a few instances of things. And there are many things inside the, inside the unikernel ecosystem. And I'm just going to pick on just a handful of them. There's tons more out there as you go foraging about uh, Jitsu, Minios, and rump kernels themselves. Zen Project is actually part of the ecosystem. Jitsu, just-in-time summoning of unikernels. It's actually a DNS server that when it gets the request, launches the unikernel VM to respond to the request that it just got. There are forms of this that do it with load balancers, et cetera. But Jitsu, really interesting thing. It could be used with a normal VM, but normal VMs take time to start up. Unikernel VMs, you know, milliseconds. So this helps with this notion of a transient system, a system that only lives long enough to do the task it's given and then disappear. MiniOS or MiniOS, say it either way. It's actually part of Zen Project in the source code. It is a unikernel system that does Nothing. But it's a great place to start hacking if you want to start building your own unikernel system. And in fact, ClickOS was built on Minios. And Rump Run, in its infancy, worked with Minios as well. So they've done a lot of work since then. But it's still kind of a foundation stone. It's a good hacking stone for people to get started. So let's talk about the Rump kernel particularly. And this. This is derived mostly from the NetBSD community. It doesn't have to be, but that's where it came, came out of. Once again, they just wanted enough kernel to get the job done. Sound familiar? The concept is not a NetBSD specific thing, but it just happened to be the place where, where people were working. And so they created this open ended framework for production quality drivers. And the net result is this thing called Rump Run. And that works not only on Zen Project but it works on bare metal, and it can actually work in user space as well. Now, here's a diagram from the rump kernel people, which shows sort of in detail what an application stack looks like. And you, this looks like you know, a fairly standard app stack uh, image that you'd see from uh, many things. But if you notice, the same thread is going all the way down from platform on up to application, because it's one unified piece of work. Now, I've given this talk a few times in the past six months. 
And the news flash is right about here where I talk about, well, there are certain things that you won't want to put in unikernels, and you know, database is probably not it. Well, news flash, I screwed up. The rump kernel people have a database currently running as a unikernel. Um, who to thunk? That's cool. I'm glad to be wrong. They announced on Twitter, go figure, the, the RAMP stack. You've heard of the LAMP stack, right? <laughs> Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. This is the RAMP stack with rump kernels in there. They use Nginx, MySQL, and PHP, each of them built on rump kernels. So they have a full stack working, and each one is a unikernel. Not too shabby start. They didn't have to re-architect anything. They didn't have to go around changing the code. What they really had to deal with is the fact that you're always cross-compiling in the unikernel world. Remember, it's kind of like embedded, so you're continuously cross-compiling to something else other than your current environment because the unikernel environment doesn't have GCC. It doesn't have a linker. It doesn't have any of those things. So you're constantly moving across. So that took a little bit of work, depending on the individual package. Some of them came across pretty, in, uh, pretty easily. They had to do some weird stuff, from what I understand, to get Nginx to uh, compile correctly. But it works. And they learned from that process, go figure. And so now they're saying it should be a whole lot easier to do the next batch of apps that they want to do because they've managed to put a lot of those things, a lot of the features they need into the rump kernel builds. It's still kind of a skunk, skunk works type thing, but it's maturing quickly, very quickly. So this opens the door to lots and lots of potential, uh, potential uh, unikernel applications. Rump kernels themselves contain code that comes, like I said, out of the BSD camp. Some of it dating back, you know, contributions from the 1980s. People back then didn't know that they were working on unikernels. Surprise, welcome to open source, you know. Uh, what you do now affects the future, big time. Uh, Anthony Canty is leading the rump kernel project. Martin Lucina is doing the, the ramp work. Here are some repositories and stuff. Like I said, it's all on the decks. Uh, the deck out on uh, zenproject.org. So if, if, this, uh, if this is interesting to you, go and see. Now another piece of the ecosystem is the base. You may have noticed that the lion's share of these unikernels work on, they, well they all work on Zen and the lion's share work only on Zen. Is that because Zen alone can do it? No. But Zen provides proper support. For one thing, since you know, Mirage has been in our incubator for a while, our developers are keenly aware of, of what's coming. This notion that you want to have thousands of VMs per machine. Remember, five years ago, if you got into double digits of VMs on a single host, you felt good about your life. You were doing something, something good. So certain things had to be re-architected within the actual hypervisor. One of the things called uh, event channels was completely rewritten so that it could support large numbers. It was a stumbling block. It isn't anymore. Theoretically, it could now handle millions. But now they're finding other stumbling blocks. We're up to about 600 concurrent VMs that will keep the performance growing correctly. At, at around 600 seems to be the choke point. We have isolated more things, and more things are coming. So the target is to get up to the two to 3,000 VMs per host right now. That's what, that's what the team is working on because that seems like a, a very reasonable and engaging target for the very near future. We want to be there. The other thing that makes uh, Zen really powerful in the ecosystem is the fact that we support power virtualization. You don't need it, but you can use it. Power virtualization, for people who don't know the term, means that instead of virtualizing hardware, you know, you can act like there's an NE2000 in the VM, and then, but then you have to pack up the data so it can be acceptable to an NE2000 and send it off. Power virtualization says, well, let's presuppose for a moment that VM is smart enough to know it's a VM. Why do we need to package something up for a piece of hardware that doesn't really exist in that VM? 
why don't I just have kind of a pipe for data? And I just take the data and <laughs> toss it down the pipe and wait for the response to come back. A lot more efficient. That's what power virtualization essentially is. And because it's a lot easier to code to a PV device than a physical device, it means that these people working in unikernels who want the minimum amount of code can just use the PV interface and just shove things down and wait for things to get back and not do all that additional driver work that really may or may not buy you a great deal. And this is not by no means the end of the story. We see other ones out there, Arrakis, which is derived from barrel fish. Anyone using barrel fish for anything? It's sort of an investigative operating system. How many people know the Go language or are learning the Go language? Yeah, it's getting more and more popular. Clive is built on Go. So, you know, there's more stuff coming. These are just the ones I have found recently. Chances are if you go and do some massive Googling right now, you'll find a few more that I haven't found yet. They are just coming and coming. Now, are unikernels a panacea? No. No, no, no. Not everything is suitable for unikernel. Like I said, you're looking at things that can exist in a single process uh, that don't need a multi-user op uh, multi operating system in order to do that particular task. Now, most things, I think, actually fit pretty well into that window, but not everything. So there will always be some mondo-sized jobs that require multi-processes within the same VM to get the job done. Are those things going to go be unikernels anytime soon? No. Don't need to be. Let them have what they want. But just like that data center that I told you about a few minutes ago, if I could have told that, that guy who designed that data center that was already full at lights on that I could buy back for him even 20% of that data center, he would jump so high we'd have to scrape him off the roof with a crane because there are limitations. And we can make an impact. And frankly, I think that that 20% number is ridiculously low for what is capable as we, as, we go down the, uh, uh, as, we, as we go down the years. And I think in the next few years, even if we meet back here in five years, you know, at Linux Fest Northwest 2020, we'll be talking about something else that will be the descendant of the unikernel, maybe the descendant of the unikernel and containers. And we'll be talking about five years ago as being the cavemen with their sticks and clubs trying to forage around in this unikernel world. This is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. We're beginning to look at this whole notion of making things that are small, tight, secure, packageable, deployable all those things that we really want in the cloud that we don't really have right now. But the big thing is the unikernel is now up the bar. We have a new standard to work with. We have something now that we can actually look at and say, you know what, we can do this. Like I said, they got a ramp stack going already. I mean, this is, this is cool. This is very, very cool and potentially incredibly powerful. What does it mean in the world of software architecture for people who deal with solutions architecture? Software architects like to talk about microservices. We may be looking at the birth of nanoservices here because it does something that the microservices doesn't do. Not only is it absolutely fast, things that can respond in fractions of a second, and we can do in populations of thousands per host, but we can actually have them arrive and disappear as part of their job. I mean, one of the problems right now with cloud orchestration is the orchestrating layer says, turn that machine on, turn that VM on, and then I will tell you when to go away. Well, that's fine for our current workloads. In the future, though, they have to deal with a workload that will sell itself to go away because it isn't efficient to, taste, to say, you know, in three-tenths of a second, by the way, it's time to turn off just told me to turn on. So the architecture is going to have to change. We're going to have to rethink what we think of when we talk about solutions, when we talk about clouds. As I said, I, I talked to one group recently that's doing Internet of Things. And they said, this would be great 
for the question of what to do when someone flips the switch. Because you know, you may have millions of switches. You don't want millions of jobs sitting around with their finger in their ear waiting for the switch to flip. But I could see millions of jobs that have the potential of going on and in fractions of a second being born, answering the flicking of the switch and die. This enables things that we couldn't logically think of just a few years ago. I hate asking this question because I always feel old when I ask this question. How many people know what Lincoln Logs are? Oh, thank God, a majority of the room. For, you, for those of you who haven't seen it, just Google it afterwards, please. <laughs> Lincoln Logs, before the age of Lego, and there was a time before the age of Lego, people had these little log cabin kits. And they looked just like the logs that you use to make a real honest to God log cabin. But they're this big. And so these were your Lincoln logs. You could sit there and you, in just a couple of minutes you could design a marvelous log cabin at one oomph of a scale compared to the real one. When things are small, they're easy to manipulate. It takes minutes to redesign a log cabin when it's this big. It takes days. If you take that same log cabin and you build it outside and they say, oh, I want to take out the back wall and give myself an extra, extra room. That takes a lot more time. What we're seeing in the unikernel world is taking what's big and cumbersome and making it small. Once it's small, we can start getting fast. So that's going to bring about an entirely new system of thought, I think, on the architecture side as well. This is an example, open source leading the way. This is not coming out of the commercial closed source world. This is coming out of people like you putting their heads together, saying, well, I can do this, I can do that, I can do this. And before long, you end up with entire functional stacks like what the rump kernel people have done just a little while ago. And that's just the beginning. Open source is the way to go in the cloud. The company I was with that was a cloud startup some years ago that failed when the banking crisis hit consumed a lot of open source, but it didn't produce it. As a result, the stuff that they did, and they had some really cool code, it's gone. That failure is noted and lost. And before long, the name will entirely be lost. That's not the way open source works. If you're not an open source person, failures are as important as successes. How many people remember the name Easel, show of hands? Yeah, just a couple. You probably have the hangover to prove it. Easel was a company back in the dot-com slash dot-bomb era. And I'm not sure really what their business model was, but my observation was that it was probably write great code, throw big-ass parties, and die in a ball of flames. <laughs> because if that's what they were up to do, they succeeded in all three points. Easel wrote some really interesting software for its age. How many people know the name Nautilus? Okay, It's the file manager that's still floating around on a number of Linux distributions today. Nautilus was Easel's flagship. It came out of Easel. Easel died so long ago that most of the people in this room have no idea what it was or who was in it. But next time you click on your device, you may be using a descendant of their code. Because their failure still lives when it comes to the code. That's why open source is so important for moving balls forward. And there's nothing more important, frankly, than what we're doing with the cloud right now in this industry. Even the failures count for something. Because we can take what worked and combine it with something with a better idea if it failed for some reason. And so we're building on both the successes and the failures of the past and not having to re-architect the same old thing over and over again. Like I said, I've been, I've been dealing with code for over 30 years. I cannot recall 
the number of sort algorithms I've had to recode and retest and recertify over and over because each time I moved from one company to the next, they wanted the same capability, but it was closed source, so anything that I did before is out the window. I have to do it all from scratch again because I have nothing to better to do with my time. Open source says enough of that. If it works, it works. Use it. If it doesn't work, fix it or make a new one, whatever. Let's just get on doing the interesting stuff. And that's why open source in the cloud is an absolutely perfect ma match. Friends don't let friends go closed source in the cloud. I'm sorry. Just say no. It's too important. And Zen Project is a, doing a, a huge piece of this because we believe in forward thinking. We realize that the data center of 10 years ago is not the data center of five years from now. The hypervisor that worked fine back then is going to need serious attention in five years. So we're working towards it now. We are continuing to move the ball forward because that's where we know we need to be. The cloud's too critical to leave to a hypervisor that isn't moving forward. I will just make that statement. If yours isn't, think about it. You really want to be tied to that wagon in five years? Decide. But we, for one, are moving forward. We are constantly in the realm of innovation. I have a separate talk coming on that tomorrow for people who are interested about the bare metal hypervisor as a platform for innovation. And so it's always innovating and always open source. As I said, we've been around for 12 years now. We're now part of the Linux Foundation. We are open, store, open source. We are proud to be open source. We are staying open source, period, end of discussion. And so we're going to move the ball forward. Now, if you want to join in, the rump kernel people were telling me they've got some tasks that they want done. If you're interested, they'd love to hear from you. I'll gladly give anyone contact information afterwards. Contact these people if you can't find them. Thankfully, uh, Ant has a rather particular name, so he's real easy to find as long as you spell it correctly. But, uh, but they're looking to put together a packaging system that will work inside a rump run world. And they want to seed that packaging system with existing applications because they're just mm -hmm. starting. They're going to start making these things all over the place. That's what they intend to. And they're looking for anyone who's willing to help out. Zen Project is always looking for contributors who can actually work at a kernel level, because that's basically where a hypervisor lives, at least for us. You're talking, talking to metal, so that's where you are. A lot of these other projects, just ask them. If they're interesting, ask them. I'm sure they would welcome the help. So this is not a closed door by any sense. This looks interesting, jump in. So I just want to say thank you, and I will gladly try to take whatever questions I can. I do have a talk tomorrow, as I said before, on the bare metal hypervisor as a platform for innovation. I want to thank a lot of the Unikernel folks for letting me use some of their images and whatnot. And you can find this, you can find it, it's actually like about a two day old version of this slide deck, but it's essentially the same online right now, so you don't have to wait if you want to find out things. Any questions? Sir. Were any of these doing uh, 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 AS, ASLR on top of the unit kernels, uh, potentially for return-oriented programming attacks? Uh, that's what I honestly I have no idea. Okay. Um, because, like I said, unfortunately, I'm not a unikernel developer, but I'm sort of moving them along <laughs> as best I can. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that yet. So the same way that the flash of utility just makes the security picture much nicer, or at least much easier to solve, it also seems like debugging is going to be increasingly possible. Well, it, it's, debugging is different. It, debugging is like debugging embedded. We've been debugging embedded for years. It's just not something we do in the data center up, up until now. With the unikernel world, that will change. Uh, as I said, I'm not sure it's going to be horrendously worse simply because most of us who work with real production systems in commercial world 
can't do a lot of debugging on the production system. It's just simply not allowed. So you have a dev environment, and you, you take the data that you can gather out of the production world, and you try to recreate and solve inside the dev environment. That much is still the same. It's just the toolkit that exists on the production server will be more limited. It'll be restricted to whatever you put there. I mean, think about it in your car. When your car malfunctions, you hook up you know, some sort of code reader type thing, and it's already been programmed to give you certain information that it can see about what the failure is. You can't go digging around inside that prom and you know, figure out what's going on, but at least you can read what's there and then take that back to the lab and try to solve it. So that's kind of where it goes from here. It's a different discipline, but it's not unique. And, you know, I would, I would say it's actually not that far from what most of us, who at least work in the commercial world, are used to doing anyway. Uh, I'd also say one advantage that I think people just sort of ask us to is that you've actually got the entire state off encapsulated in a small amount of memory. Mm -hmm. So if you've got, say, an 8 megabyte image, you can dump the entire kernel all the way through the application if you want to go to the Yeah. Yeah, the fact that you're, once again, working with very small, well, something that used to be huge yeah. and is now small, suddenly to dig through a, a dump is a far less daunting task than it used to be because it's a fraction of what... Much all of it is actually related to what you were doing, not what every other process. Right, yeah. You don't have to worry about the guy who's sending email to his grandmother or whatever. It's just not part of the picture. Uh, are the unikernel development environments Um, no, the, the building is generally done on a full Linux and or Unix operating system. Um, and it, like I said, it's always a cross-compile at this point because that, that endpoint is different from, where, from the, the environment you're starting with. And that's kind of, you know, it's kind of, like I said, embedded. So you're, 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 you're dealing with this constant motion uh, between environments, and that's just kind of a given the way it sits right now. Um, the, uh, the only thing that gets even close to that is what the OSV people are doing, but even then they don't do d development in OSV from what I know. Uh, they have a little bit richer stack, it's fatter, like I said, they're talking about megabytes, not kilobytes, but it's still quite interesting, the stuff that they can pull off, the fact that the ease with which they can get things in there. In fact, Don Marty likes to say, basically, as long as you're not doing a fork, as long as you're not starting a second process, even if it's multi-threaded, multi-thread's fine, but if you're not starting that second process, chances are they can pop it in and get it going in minutes. It's, it's, it's that functional. 